What if your job was to build the next big software system that ran one of these pieces of the real world? Say, an airplane, the autonomous flight controller for that airplane, or an autonomous car that drove itself, or another kind of vehicle entirely, the space shuttle, which has to go up into space and come back with humans aboard, or the power grid, or a DNA sequencer, or many other kinds of machines. What do all of these have in common? Safety is really critical. Humans could be injured or killed by any of these devices. So we need the software that runs them to be much more reliable than your average phone app, say for TikTok. That's what the next segment of this course is about. What are the techniques you would need to use to build software that is that reliable? Much earlier, we saw this same slide uh, when we talked about testing, and it's time to come back to it. There are many approaches to the process of validation, that is, ensuring that software does what it's supposed to do. And we've talked before about social approaches all the way up to mathematical approaches. On the mathematical side of that spectrum, you now have a lot of experience with OCaml's type system, which is more strict than other languages. And perhaps you've come to appreciate that. Perhaps you've even had the feeling yourself now of coming to the point in coding and being able to realize, wow, once my code compiles, it does what I want it to do, which is not necessarily the case in other languages because their type systems simply aren't expressive enough. On the other hand, it does make it more annoying sometimes to get the code to compile, of course. Well, let's take it one step beyond that, beyond type systems to what's called formal verification. The notion of formal here is in the sense of mathematics, of being formal about what you are trying to prove. So you should be familiar with this kind of idea from CS2800. Formal verification is something that has a history spanning back to about the 60s or 70s. Back then, as it turns out, our very own Professor Grease at Cornell was one of the ones leading the charge in this area. And back then, say about in the 70s, formal verification, that is proving the correctness of program, is something that scaled to yeah, maybe tens of lines of code. It was something that took a lot of human work to do, uh, a lot of proof on paper, and it wasn't always necessarily a pleasant thing to do. It kind of had, a, for a while maybe, a bit of a reputation of something that wasn't going to go anywhere. And you may still meet people who, who think that from time to time. By the way, the, the same thing happened with machine learning once upon a time. And look where we've gotten now with machine learning. Well, also look where we've gotten now with formal verification. Now, research projects in it scale to real software. For example, there's CompCert which is a verified C compiler. It's been proven correct, and studies were done to show that it had many, many fewer bugs than other C compilers. Now, you might be thinking, how could it have bugs if we proved it correct? It's because not the entire part of the compiler was proved correct. There were some pieces that there were part of the parser that weren't originally proved correct. Actually, they've gone ahead now and done those as well. Other examples include SEL4, which is a verified microkernel OS. Why not, which provided uh, a library on top of which was built a verified database management system. That was done uh, in part by our very own Professor Greg Morissette, who actually is now the Dean and Vice Provost of Cornell Tech. More mathematical results include a computer checked proof of the four color theorem. You might remind, re remember that from uh, CS2110. It says that uh, you need at most four colors uh, to color a planar map. Uh, there's other more exciting work in progress, like Project Everest, which is done in part by Microsoft Research. That's a verified HTTPS stack. And there's all kinds of other interesting projects going on, too. So in about 40 years, we got from the point of being able to do only um, somewhat toy examples to real software. And that's as research efforts. Some of these took 
um, person years worth of effort. Uh, SEL4 was especially notable for that. But in another 40 years, where might we be? Well, by then I'll be at the end of my career, uh, but you'll be in the prime of yours. And so I'm excited about what you will see 40 years from now in terms of what it's able to do uh, in um, improving the correctness of software. Uh, what are we going to do here in 3110? Well, it's not going to be uh, an entire verified microkernel OS. Sorry. We are going to do the following. We're going to write some small, purely functional programs. And by purely functional, what I mean, of course, is that there are no side effects, there's no mutability, there's no I.O., and they always terminate. Now, there are ways to get around all of those restrictions, but they become technically more difficult as you build them up. So we're going to start with something easy, small, and pure. And we're going to do proofs about programs that involve integers, lists, options, trees, uh, and a couple other data structures as well. We will be proving correctness theorems about these programs. So this goes back to what you have learned or what you are learning in CS2800. You will need to know some logic for this. You will definitely get some more practice with induction as we do this. Now, our goal in all of this is not to be 100% completely formal. We're going to be rigorous. We're going to be careful about the claims that we make and the proof techniques that we use and the justifications that we give for them. But we're not going to attempt to dot every I and cross every T. That can be done. It simply takes much, much more work. And if you're ever interested in, in that, I do have a class, CS4160, Formal Verification, where we dive much more into all of this.